So welcome to all of those who are here uh, to Great Cities Institute. I'm Vanessa Cordova, director, for those of you who may not know me. Our topic today is worker cooperatives. Our, what we're going to do, because the organization uh, folks are unable to come here, we're going to show a video that they have produced. So we get to see a movie, so that you got your popcorn and so on. Yes, sir. I, for a little background, I, I, I help train with training for New Era. So see, this is any, this is great. This is perfect. Any, you know, no, I'll no, we will definitely call on you. Okay. You're welcome to come up further up front if you'd like <laughs> and participate. So actually, that's great, um, and that'll work just fine. Okay. And then uh, and then we have Nick Theodore, who is also still uh, here, prepared to share his remarks. So so. May, I don't. I'm not sure how we want to do this. Maybe after the video, maybe you can speak, and then we, and then have Nick speak. Whatever you want to do. Yeah. yeah. Or we can play it. We can kind of play it by ear. But let me say something very quickly about New, New Era Windows, and then about Nick, uh, about Nick Theodore. Um, well, and actually, before I do that, we've been talking a lot here in Great Cities about the importance of worker cooperatives as a model for engendering more uh, employment, particularly self-employment opportunities. So the worker cooperative concept uh, embodies a lot of really important values, you know, pulling people together to be able to share uh, their, their skills in such a way that they can increase then the opportunities that would come to them. So we're really excited about the worker cooperative model. We know that, it's, that in some ways in, and in many cultures it's existed forever, right? Um, and it's a very sort of deep and very historically rich concept. We also know that there are models in places like Ramadan um, in Spain. We know that in Cleveland there's something called Evergreen. We've talked about it a lot as something we think would be really great for, for a mechanism around youth employment, but also in tie to neighborhood revitalization. Are there ways that worker cooperatives can enhance that? So we're really big on worker cooperatives and we want to know more. We'd like to partner more and we'd like to build up uh, the capacity. We also know that there's a national network, in fact, that met here back in June. So there's more and more interest that's building and growing around the cooperative. So th this session is uh, is done in the spirit of trying to encourage and promote uh, worker cooperatives. So near, New Era Windows is a worker-owned cooperative, Windows manufacturer based here in Chicago. After decades as a privately owned firm, in 2012, workers bought the factory. Today, the plant is collectively owned and run democratically. You know, and that's so much part of the essence, right? The idea that it's corporately owned, it's run democratically. And we apologize that New Era Windows had to cancel this morning due to a rush of orders from customers trying to replace windows before the Chicago winter. That's a great reason to have to miss, right? I was thinking the weather was going to improve on Saturday, but I looked at the 10-day forecast and. Then and uh, uh, unfortunately, it is not, right? We're going to be hovering right around the 35 mark or so um, for the next uh, 10 days. But we do have, as I mentioned, the video to show featuring worker-owned nerds from the new era that includes the history of how their co-op was formed. We have a gentleman here. I'm sorry, your name? Dennis Keller. Dennis Keller, who has been involved in training some of the folks who are comprised new era windows. And then we have our own uh, and wonderful Nick Theodore, who is a professor in urban planning and policy, also a fellow with Great Cities Institute. In his recent research, he has worked with day laborers and other contingent workers as he has been investigating the changing labor markets with the neoliberal urbanism. He's an editor for Antipode, which is a radical journal of geography. So with that, I guess we'll get the, the wheels rolling, watch the video, and then we'll go for it. Thank you, Arthur, for coming. The first time the workers of what was then the Republic Windows and Doors factory in Chicago were laid off by their factory owner, they occupied that factory. The second time they were laid off by their owner, they decided to take over and become their own boss. This May, those workers are now the happy worker owners of New Era Windows, which is opening for business as we speak. So we decided to make a co-op because we were tired of our life being in someone else's hand. Uh, at Republic, they had walked away from our job. Then seriously about the company, they had walked away from our job. 
and we hadn't walked away. So we had found out about the cooperative and we started pursuing it. And lo and behold, here we are today. We started buying windows from uh, New Era Windows as now. Uh, we're taking orders, we're uh, ready to run our production, and we hope to have 100% of this factory running in the and the future and the future months. The United Electrical Workers have been a big part of this story. So has the working world. Sergeant Martin is with us from Working World. It came onto my radar when it came onto most people's. It it was on the nightly news all of a sudden, and I also was getting a lot of emails from different activist groups that I had known who knew about the work I was doing with uh, factories in Argentina. And um, it did remind me a lot of Argentina. You saw this incredible crisis. Um, all these you know, factories being closed. We were in a financial crisis just like Argentina. Um, people felt like there was no option. And I saw that factory, and of course what came to my mind was Argentina, the idea that the workers could take it over and run it. And what are some of the obstacles that they faced? Because this has been a really long time. People who thought, OK, uh, they're going to start selling windows now. Uh, it's been about a year of a wait. The first obstacle was they weren't even being allowed to the bargaining table for, to try to buy the factory. And that was the first public fight you saw. And then they won that right to, to bid on the factory. And then people didn't hear anything for a while, uh, partly because there was a non-disclosure agreement that had to be signed, et cetera, um, and partly because we weren't sure what to say to the press. We didn't know when it would open. But so it took about three months to negotiate that contract. Um, this is all you know, white knuckle, all the workers you know, meeting every day in the, un in the union hall, um, to figuring out you know, how to go every step. I mean, every day we're there for hours going through contracts. And, um, and then you come to September, and then People might not realize this. They actually had to dismantle their factory. They didn't, they're not in the same factory. So it wasn't a question just, OK, we'll move in and start running it. They had to dismantle the factory. They had to move the entire factory. We had to, unfortunately, wait about four months for the new landlord to fulfill their promised uh, tenant improvements. And then finally, about two and a half, three months ago, the workers were able to start rebuilding their new factory. There have been times that we wasn't sure if we were going to be able to, to get new era off the ground because uh, when well, you have to get invested. So, you know, we don't we don't have like a lot of people just knocking our door down to loan us money. We were very fortunate to meet and to get familiar with the working world uh, because they believed in us and they have been uh, very supportive of us morally and financially which is what is needed. When they closed, we feel like uh, it was the end of our life after eight years working in one place and you feel like it's your home. But uh, when they closed, you realize like, we are not nobody. Some people, they decide to close the factories so they, they don't, don't make the, the money they, they expect, even though they make profit, but they don't, they prefer to make more and more, more money each time and they close the factory for that reason. And, and uh, at this point, I feel most confidential, most better, because we want just make money to uh, make our kids go to college and have a better life and show the world that it's, I know it's a hope in this country and it's a better alternative. And being an owner own company is uh, to be amazing. And we have my, my co-workers working together and creating jobs with the community around this city, and I would like to uh, spread that idea around the United States. The workers that are now, uh, today, opening the New Era factory in Chicago have themselves put in an enormous amount of work oh, yeah. into learning and training and coming to understand how this, uh, how this could happen. Um, what can you tell us about, about that process and the relationships that some of these people have built. I don't want to make it sound that like things are black and white and it's perfection, but it's definitely been nothing shy of extraordinary. All those obstacles I talked about, like you know, every bend we try to get insurance or land or you know landlord and they would bulk it at the co-op. The only reason we've been able to persevere and get it done in only a year is because of the extraordinary potential that the cooperative has unlocked. Us opening up this plant, we we have learned that we are so much more than what we thought that we were because in opening up this plant we have done our own electrical work, we've done the plumbing work, and all we thought we were was just window makers. <laughs> <laughs> the unbelievable potential 
that's been unlocked. I, I really can't overstate that. And, and I don't even know if it's going to work. We have to remember that even as an excited activist. It still has a long way to go, even though it's opening its doors now. We all have to be behind it. But, you know, I, if this were looked at by a normal investment institution, they would have assumed two to five million dollars to open a business like this. It's been less than a million dollars, and the only reason is because that other three to five million in value has been brought by the worker. Talk about how the equipment got moved. So the factory that they were in, they had to leave. It was crazy expensive. It was a foolish business decision, somewhat born on corruption of, there was no reason for it to be in that part of Chicago. They wanted $13 a square foot. We found a place for $4 a square foot. Easy decision for the workers to make. Um, but you had to move it all. It was an incredible amount of stuff to move. It turned out to be 80 uh, tractor trailers full of stuff. And we had a very little time to move before uh, the workers started to get uh, fined for it. And so we went to professional movers, and they told us it was about 40 truckloads, half of what it would be. And they told us it would be what turned out to be over $100,000 it would have amounted to. Um, the workers said, well, forget that. And they moved it themselves. Um, they moved it twice the speed the professionals said they'd move it. Instead of four truckloads a day, they moved eight. And they moved it for $18,000. And that type of, uh, maybe they weren't movers. This isn't what people did, but they all banded together. They organized themselves. They worked it out. You know, I was, it was good exercise for a couple of days there, or about a month or two. Um, you know, and everyone loaded trucks, unloaded them. We organized having people on one end, people on the other end. You know, how to, how to make the, the trucks move most efficiently, et cetera. And it was just like that type of flowering of potential that's just locked out of our normal system, uh, to me, is staggering. And those workers, I don't know whether we've mentioned, it's predominantly immigrants, people of color. Um, there's an aspect of that story, that, that part of the story that I think is worth pointing out, too. Uh, that these are people who are bringing jobs to a community, people who are often told that they're taking jobs from other folks. Absolutely. Yeah, it's 100% owned by people of color. Uh, there's African American and mostly Mexican, or Hispanic in general, but the Mexicans have a huge majority of the food's really good in the factory. Um, and without a doubt, I mean, you know, if you think about the way some like Mitt Romney talked about the takers in this country, he was directing his gaze at the people who are now, who took a factory that's going to be obliterated, <coughs> rebuilt it and by themselves, um, and created jobs for people and created wealth for this country. So, you know, that, that potential that's in immigrants, that's in people who have been traditionally marginalized, um, that's what, I, mean, I see that in, in workers across the country who are marginalized, who are or paid wages like this, or considered to be job takers. So, you know, the way that we're flipping things on its head and, and thinking about workers as potential rather than as costs you know, to be eliminated, um, I think also makes us look differently at, at what we think about what immigrants bring, um, and rather than take. Um, and and New Era is a shining example of that. Talk about the crisis and what role it's played. Do you think this would have happened if it hadn't been for the financial crash of 2008? I mean, I'd like to think that the crisis of 2008 illustrated the huge uh, fractures in our financial system and the huge abuses that it groups on the rest of the country. And that'll, that that's enough to at least have people experiment in things like worker control, in capital subordinate to workers like, our, like the bank we run, that sort of thing. Now that first owner from what was then Republic Windows and Doors hasn't gone away. He's still somewhere around. Uh, now he has competition. Um, what's the prospect like for the new factory? And what can people do if they want to help the new era side of this fight? Yeah, um, the former owner, the one who was being sued by, uh, et cetera, by the, by the government, and the one who doesn't have such a great reputation, is still around. He didn't actually go bankrupt. They opened up a new factory and has been running it. And he's definitely been haunting around the factory now, seeing what kind of place he can poke at, calls me 10 times a day sometimes, calls the worker 10 times a day for real. And without a doubt, it's going to be hard to break into that market. Now, there should be plenty of space in the market. The workers have a really low overhead. They should be able to survive on a tiny percentage of the market. It's really not the competition, but that's obviously what this former owner sees them as. Um, and they're small. They don't have all the inside connections. They don't have all the backroom buddies. They're a company of only 20 people right now. So without a doubt, now more than ever, they need the community to come to them. People who think this is the kind of production we want to support, um, not people getting paid eight dollars an hour through temp agency to do this work. You know, we're a country that was built on manufacturing. They're supposed to be middle class jobs. If you can provide a window at a price that's competitive, which they can, and have and support middle class jobs, that's what we want to support in the United States. This job and this factory it represents a lot of hope and determination because it shows my grandkids and my children 
there was hard work, determination that you can make it, that you don't necessarily have to just be at the other end of the stick, that you can take control of your life. We're improvising a little bit since uh, the folks from New Era Windows uh, can't make it today. Maybe what I'll do is uh, I had prepared a set of comments and maybe I'll fill in a little back, bit of backstory and then who's Dennis, right? Yes. Maybe you could yeah. uh, correct me or uh, add whatever you want to add. But good to see everybody. Uh, I really wanted to make three observations and given that they're not here, I'll try to elaborate them a little bit more. And I, I wanted to start with the backstory in case there were folks that, that may not. Uh, know all of it or remember it too well. Uh, these workers in this uh, this evolving plant came to local and national prominence back in 2008 when um, the workers made the decision to occupy a plant that had announced uh, that it was closing. Uh, Republic Windows and Doors located on Goose Island made an announcement that it was going to abruptly close, laying off about 279 workers as well as 21 managers. Um, and upon that, that announcement, uh, everyone was going to lose their job. If you see the workers now and in, you get a little bit of a sense of, of them from the video, if you see them now and, and think about what they're doing, you might walk out with a sense that this had been a radicalized workforce, that somehow these workers were unusual, that there was some sort of strong solidarity in the, in the plant, and that uh, these workers were like natural born fighters. That's not the case. Um, like, like every organizing challenge, whether it's out in a neighborhood or within a workplace, these workers confronted the same types of divisions that divide organizing efforts pretty much everywhere. Workers were divided along the lines of race, around nationality, around citizenship. This was not some sort of unusual workplace where the workers had a high degree of solidarity. There, there had been a union in the plant. There actually had been a previous union before UE, the United Electrical Workers, had been there. Um, the, the previous union before UE hadn't served them well at all. And uh, in, in many ways, I remember talking to workers at the time, just after the occupation, it was quite clear that they had a lot of <clears throat> community building to do within that plant. This was not a ready-made place. And so the, the idea that they would go against the norm uh, and occupy a plant, right? This is before occupying Wall Street and Gizzy Park and all this, right? The Indignados in Spain, this is before all of that that they would take a page out of the strikers from Flint, Michigan in the 1930s and sit in a plant because they thought what was happening was unjust. That was a radical idea and in no way um, like written into the way they behaved. It took an incredible effort to get to that point and it happened very quickly. So to the extent that they become radicalized, it was because they were observing a pattern of disinvestment that was occurring. They were observing something didn't seem quite right. Uh, some machinery was leaving the plant and other parts of the stock was disappearing. It didn't make sense and they saw this over weeks and months leading up to the occupation. Um, and so even to the point where they would follow the owners. And so they, they became quite aware that the owners were acting with not in good faith, let's say. And there were some signals that they were going to, um, that, that maybe trouble was brewing. But at that moment to occupy the plant, they had overcome their personal fears. Are we breaking the law? They had overcome, as I said, a range of divisions that keep workers separated on the shop floor, and they had to find some common ground. And I think one of the amazing stories about the story is that they did. And that upon occupying that plant, they didn't go quietly. This was a, 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 a plant, an occupation that galvanized uh, public support in a way that we usually don't see these days from worker struggles. And it wasn't just unions and others that came out, sure they did, but politicians, uh, 
President-elect Obama, uh, local politicians. So in many ways, it was quite surprising the way in which this occupation captured the public imagination, captured the national imagination, and shown a spotlight on some of the injustices that occur within this economy. And, and so in that regard, you can look at these workers as leaders in what was going to become uh, a broader critique of finance capitalism in this country, a broader critique of inequality in this country, and some of the big discussions that we had uh, during the Great Recession of 2007 to 2009, they were on the front end of this in many ways. So that was one quick observation, that, but I think it, it's important to remember the backstory that leads up to the development of, of the cooperative. Uh, the second observation is that, you know, at the point that all this is happening, it, things are moving quickly and workers are desperately trying to save their jobs. There is no master plan. This is a moment of experimentation for these workers to try to figure out a way to save the plant and save their jobs. Uh, they make a, a quick reference to Sirius Energy. Uh, in 2009, they negotiated with the union a buyout of the plant by another uh, for-profit company, this California-based Sirius Energy. Um, and Sirius Energy took over the plant and began to hire back workers. But here you see one of the problems. At the point of the occupation, there have been 279 workers and 21 managers. As Sirius Ma uh, Energy began to build back the plant, uh, they hired about 70. So the plant already at this point is about a quarter or less of the, the, of the capacity when it had been Republic windows and doors. And then, as, as Ricky Macklin mentions, uh, suddenly in 2011, deja vu. Sirius Energy decides it's going to close the plant. Um, and in another interview, uh, Ricky Macklin um, <laughs> sort of summed it up. Uh, he said, Republic walked away from our jobs. Sirius walked away from our jobs. But we're, we are not walking away from our jobs. He went on in the interview, I don't remember what it was, maybe in Cranes or something. Uh, he said, we don't know for sure if it'll be successful. But we didn't know that the occupation would be successful. I thought we were all going to jail, right? I mean, so you can see, they were really stepping into unknown territory here. And, and then I think he says the, the point that for me sums up a lot of this. Unless we step out and try, we'll never know. And so his, his, his point being that they had to play the hand they were dealt. They, the plan had now been closed two times. It was time to think about things differently. And unless they tried it, they really would never know. And I think, you know, in other interviews, I mean, he's, he's quite um, a media star in a certain regard. In other interviews, he's quite clear. You know, he's got kids, he's got grandkids, he's toward the end of his working career. He's at, you know, 58, 59 at the moment. Um, and and he, he said, many people my age, they're pulling out of the labor market. Stuff like this is happening to them and they're retreating. And, and you can see uh, in his motivation is not to retreat, to try something and not to end his working career, not knowing whether it could have been successful. So they, the, um, you know, they face the occupation, they face the risks of going to jail, they win, they, great, they gather some public support, only, you know, they get a new buyer for the plant, the, their hopes are dashed again. Um, and so they, they, they move into the new uh, era facility, and there's something poetic about this as well. They set up a unionized, worker-owned and operated business, and they move into a new facility. The, the previous, that facility had been the previous location of Campbell's Soup. So those of you that have been around uh, ur the urban planning department here for a long time, around QED and so on, will remember that that Campbell's Soup plant closing occurred during a wave of deindustrialization that hit this city and hit this region. And that Campbell's Soup was one of dozens of brand name major multinational corporations that shuttered the plant, um, laid off uh, predominantly African American and Latino workers, uh, and, and led, left the city. And to me, there's something poetic about a worker-owned cooperative that steps into that same facility um, with a different kind of logic. With a logic that says we're not just going to be a fly-by-night business that'll move 
uh, as quickly as we can in the search for, for higher profits and, and better margins, we're interested in reinvesting in our community and staying here. And I think there is something um, sweet about, about that little detail. Um, third observation is that cities are now starting to look at these um, endeavors. And certain cities are developing city policies to support the development of cooperatives and to see cooperatives as a um, targeted supplier for some of their needs. New York City uh, is one in particular that has made great strides in the last few years. Uh, it does have one of the more famous worker cooperatives um, in the country, the Brock Space uh, Cooperative Home Care Association, uh, which has been going strong for, for years now. And, be and because of some progressive shifts within the City Council of New York City and local government, there's been a desire to try to support similar efforts. Uh, the goal that a number of City Council members have made has been to make New York City a leader in providing municipal support for these kind of democratically run enterprises. Uh, a city re council report recently um, made a statement, I just want to quote it briefly, oftentimes minimum and low wage jobs do not provide enough of an economic boost to provide upward mobility for many New Yorkers. Worker cooperatives are designed to build assets and wealth among low income individuals and communities and create entrepreneurs and city leaders. And so in, in this municipality at least, there's a recognition that um, incorporating worker cooperatives into a broader economic development program has multiple benefits in terms of leadership, entrepreneurship, jobs, and so on. Now, I've been rattling along. I, I, there, I didn't think I had three points. It turns out I actually have four. And what you can't tell from this moment is I'm actually a cooperative skeptic. Um, <laughs> So, uh, I want to raise a few more critical comments um, in a backhanded way while also praising what I think is great about this. So, cooperatives are a, a countercurrent um, in, in these current times. They cut against the grain of current economic practices. Right? Cooperatives are based on so much, uh, on the opposite of so much of what is wrong in the, the U.S. economy. They're based on values of self-help, of self-responsibility, of democracy, equality, equity, and solidarity. I mean, these are terms we don't ordinarily apply to almost any other aspect of the U.S. economy. And so I think it's absolutely crucial from a political standpoint, you know, small p political standpoint, that, um, that we have alternative models that can offer an alternative agenda, that we have local governments that are prepared to support those, and that we have workers that will be bold enough to cut against the mainstream. And, and, and cooperatives are founded on a number of principles. I wanted to, to focus just on, on three that I, I think really uh, put them in stark contrast with so much economic decision making that occurs these days. And the first is this one of democratic member control, right? Cooperatives are democratic organizations that are controlled by their members uh, who actively participate in their policies and making decisions. In, in my real work with, with day laborers, uh, there's been a move to set up worker centers which also are, are run on very similar principles where day laborers are involved in the decision making and governance of those worker centers. They set the wage rates. They, they figure out how to deal with internal conflicts. They set the agenda of the organization. So I'm a big supporter of those kinds of organizations that move to a direct democracy kind of model where we don't delegate decision making, but we make it ourselves. The second principle that I think is worth underscoring here is member economic participation. Members contribute equitably um, and democratically control the capital of their co-op. Uh, you know, at least part of the capital is common property of the co-op itself, and members use those surpluses to develop the co-op either by setting up reserves, uh, benefiting mem you know, members uh, through pay and so on, and supporting other activities approved by their membership. So you've got to, you have to buy in to, to play, um, but then once you've done that, those resources are, are allocated democratically. And then the third principle, uh, is one of autonomy and independence. Uh, cooperatives are autonomous, they're self-help organizations that are controlled by their members. 
uh, sure, they'll enter into other um, into relationships with other organizations, including governments, in the case of New York, hopefully. Uh, and they'll also raise capital from outside sources. Uh, but they do so on their own terms, and they do so on the basis of democratic control and decision making. Um, and, and so what I think this does, and, and they alluded to it a bit in that video, is that this shifts the underlying priorities of the business, and it does begin to advance an alternative business model. You know, can a window making business uh, under you know thrive under such an arrangement? Well, as Ricky Macklin said, unless we step out and try, we'll never know. And that's what they're doing. But we also have to remember that businesses operate with a profit margin. Uh, in building contracts, sort of the area that uh, New Era is in, the profit margin usually is in the area of 10 to 15 percent. Um, in some businesses, it can be higher, and in others, it can be lower. Uh, but we have to remember that um, there isn't this tremendous scope to improve uh, pay and conditions necessarily. In, in many ways, any co-op has to participate in the market of which it is a part. Uh, I've worked for years with nonprofit temp agencies, another uh, business venture I'm pretty skeptical of. Uh, the reason I'm skeptical of nonprofit temp agencies in the day labor market you know, where you supply warehouses and factories, is that the margins are incredibly low. The gross margins of a day labor agency, despite what you've heard, are 13%. That's the gross margin, the total. The, the profit margin is about 1.5%, a penny and a half on the dollar. So even if we got rid of the owner, and even if we made everyone uh, a member, the amount you can actually transfer back because of the low road nature of the industry itself is so incredibly limited. So, you know, I know we like um, uh, co-ops for a lot of reasons, but we have to also understand the industry side of the equation because the industry side dictates so many of the terms upon which they will operate. Now, a worker cooperative does have an advantage. With all, all things being equal, the cooperative can, can reduce its price of its products and services in comparison to its competitors. You even saw an example of that in the video from the fact that they could reduce their moving costs. Um, and, but, you know, it, it, it's still, it, 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 co-ops still suffer the problem that other small businesses suffer, which is the problem of self-exploitation. I mean, they, could, they couldn't have reduced the moving costs from 100000 to 18000 without incredible toll on the individual. Let's be honest about it. If you ever tried to move your own apartment, you realize how difficult it is, and professional movers do know a thing or two. Um, so, you know, there are those, those kinds of, of dangers of self-exploitation, and if you do look at the current wages at, at New Era, uh, they're having trouble making the minimum wage at the moment. Right? Again, a reminder that you have to compete in the markets of which you are a part. And then there's one other market consideration. Again, Ricky Macklin mentions it here in the, in the video when he says, we don't have people knocking down our doors to give us money. To grow um, New Era or any of one of these manufacturing cooperatives, you need finance capital, and that likely is going to take you to the financial industry and finance markets. Uh, finance markets right now are skeptical of cooperatives, and it's a, it's a maybe unfair, but it's a limiting factor that impacts uh, their short-run viability as they need as their needs for working capital increase, their growth potential as that need for capital working capital soars and their long run ability to weather the ups and downs in an industry that is so subject to cyclical fluctuations. Don't let there be another recession next year, as many are warning, because the building industry will take a hit again, and, and likely suppliers like, like uh, New Era as well. But again, to quote uh, Ricky Macklin one last time, unless we step out and try, we'll never know. Um, and so I think this is a, it, it's a, it's a fantastic experiment um, one that reverses uh, the economic logics upon which this economy has been based and reverses the economic development priorities that have gripped a city like this. We're going to build locally, keep it in the neighborhood, hire the workers um, who have been working here and so on. And, and for that reason, it needs to be celebrated. And the only way that worker cooperatives make it through this difficult transition period that they're in is through widespread community support. Uh, that's true if you're talking about a domestic worker co-op, and it's true, I think, if you talk about a window maker. They need the community support uh, to make it through what 
for a, through a period that for any small business is incredibly difficult and trying time. Uh, but you can see uh, you have a group of workers with a lot of spirit, ingenuity, and the willingness to, to experiment and take risks. And so I hope um, they'll be successful. So anyway, impromptu. Said more than I thought I might. Yeah. Said more than I, more than I thought I knew. But uh, I don't know, Dennis. What do you say about all this? Uh, uh, my name is Dennis Keller. By the way, I'm with the Center for Workplace Democracy here oh. in Chicago. Um, we uh, we helped. We provided some level of training to to the worker owners of New Era. Um, I, I I don't disagree with any of that skepticism that you share. Uh, I, I I will say, and this is uh, this is in my opinion. I think that. You know, one of the cru crucial parts of, of developing a cooperative is to have a feasibility study. And I think, in my opinion, that if a feasibility, if someone was to be brought in to do a feasibility study on New Era, it probably would have said that this was a crazy idea. <coughs> but you're, you're, you know, everything that, that Professor Theodore has mentioned is absolutely true about this, this group of workers. They're incredibly determined, incredibly resourceful. They didn't care whether someone was going to say, no, you, this is probably not a feasible project. They just didn't care. They were going to do it anyway. Because they knew what they were facing in the future, right? I mean, you're talking about a group of workers that probably their only skill was to make windows, right? Nothing else. And they knew they made a very uh, keen economic decision. They, looked, they were looking at the future. They knew that if they, lost, they, you know, they, that, that they were out of a job, chances are that they were going to be doing some sort of low-wage job. Much less pay than the, what they were getting at working at, at Republic. So they made the economic decision that, you know, we're going to do this no matter what. And it, 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 it is an incredibly risky endeavor. They are facing a lot of low-row competitors. We, we, we were, you know, we were getting word of a competitor housing workers in, a fact, in the factory that they were making the window in. Right? I mean, this. <laughs> you. How do you compete? How do you pay yourself a living wage and compete with a company like that? So yes, they have. They're facing an incredible uh, uh, competitive industry. Um, but again, I mean, it was a, it was a determination that they made. It was an economic decision. They thought that they had they had no choice in to but but to do this. So. Well, and the reason I'm here for those of you who came in later is because they had so many orders to fill in preparation of the of the coming poll in the next in the next few, in yeah. the next few months. Yeah. But that it hit today and so they are they are uh, they're busy filling orders. Yeah. Days. Let me give you a little update to what that video showed. Uh, their their competitor, the, 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 the person who was being investigated sued by by various organizations, the lenders, the city of Chicago, uh, that filed bankruptcy. He was a, a original owner of Republic Door and Window. He had and went and opened up another company. That company is in bankruptcy right now. So one of their competitors has filed for bankruptcy recently. And from what it seems like, they are starting to get some of that business from, from that, that, that uh, competitor that has filed bankruptcy. I mean, what, if they were here, one thing I would have asked them is that, you know, the building supply industry is becoming incredibly centralized uh, with your Home Depots, Lowe's, Menards, and so on, capturing so much of the consumer market. If you're outside of that system, uh, it's very hard, I think, to, to increase your sales dramatically. And so with Pella, with Anderson, with two, you know, two major window companies, uh, I think neither of them, I think, are in either of those stores. Uh, I think it shows you how competitive it is to secure those contracts. So the other aspect of competing in this market is to get access to consumers. So I would have asked them a bit how they plan to reach the market in an industry that where those doors seem to be closing. Well, when we were going through the process of, of developing a, a marketing plan, the the determination was you know we, we had several distribution channels you know the the, the, the big retailers uh, going directly to consumers such as some like a, like a Felco I mean I, I don't know if people have heard of Felco uh, windows they go directly to consumer. And then the other one was to go with contractors, you know, to target the contractors. Um, and at that time, the decision was to do a combination of focusing on direct consumers and also uh, focus on contractors. And to not even, you know, consider trying to get into a home depot or a real estate. Um, you know, I'm not sure, 
I haven't I, I haven't checked in on them recently, so I'm not sure if they've maintained that strategy. Um, you know, because you know, it, going directly to consumers requires an, a level of infrastructure that you know, in a level of investment in infrastructure that that they, they just didn't have access to. So I don't know if they decided that maybe let's just focus on getting out to contractors. Is that you know? It, when we looked at it, when I looked at it, I thought that would have been the best route to go. So I don't, I'm not sure if that's what they pursued. Yeah, because I think the other the barriers to entry are very high because um, to go directly to consumer, you need a mass marketing campaign, yeah. advertising campaign, probably with television. You're not going to be able to afford that. And then the barriers to entry um, of what a Home Depot or Lowe's would require of their suppliers are simply too great for a small startup firm, which is essentially what we're looking at here. Yeah. So this is a question just related to this question of consumers. I mean, how do, I, I'm very interested, I thank you, I always learn something when I can hear you speak. Um, how does, um, in terms of thinking of alternative economic models, how do um, co-ops fit into solidarity economies and not just appealing to um, consumers based on, you know, who puts the best windows in your house or your business, but but really a kind of political appeal to conscientious consumers um, parallel to the, the ways in which um, various campaigns are restricting investment and boycotting certain certain companies. I think solidarity economies are trying to say, depending on what your service or your commodity is, um, how can you appeal to uh, a community of potential consumers, you know, based on yeah. ethics and not just uh, economics. Yeah, I, mean, I think that's a great point. And, and so what the what I have seen about cooperatives is they tend to uh, make their initial market imprint in that sort of environment. Uh, and that's been certainly the, the case with domestic worker co-ops, one of the few co-ops I am familiar with. Uh, and, and that's exactly how they're able to start the business flow. Uh, with um, because they're operating on a different a set of financial and ethical principles and hopefully can appeal to, to a, a segment of the population. Um, how long that can sustain it's unclear. And I think the, dif the difference that I see with a window manufacturer and a domestic worker co-op or let's say some of the local food grocery store options is that you only need windows every so often and not all of us need a window right now. Uh, but with domestic work or food, you can expect a more steady stream of, of consumer. And, and I think that's one of the challenges that they run into. But every discussion that I've seen of, of smaller co-ops run in this way uh, really relies on uh, consumer support uh, and getting the word out. Is that oh, yeah, what you're I, I, Yeah, I mean, we, we have the, the privilege of working with uh, a group in Waukegan that is starting a home house cleaning cooperative. Uh, and they are positioning themselves in the market as a green you know they're they're they're, they're going to be using green uh, uh, environmentally friendly products, and they are positioning themselves in that in, in a way of, of you know socially conscious cu customers um, that are willing to to uh, to use their services. Actually, I have a, I got three questions. Um, the first one has to do with um, what did you they do for income in that interim period? So they, there were lawsuits, uh, there was Bank of America and everything, there was a lot, this became a huge campaign. And there was a settlement finally. But one of the problems of the, the initial closing of Republican windows and doors was that uh, they were not gonna get the unemployment insurance. Their pensions had been slashed to almost nothing. And so th this was really a, flight, a, fright, a fight for short-term survival. Fortunately, um, they were successful in that fight partially and were able to individually um, get settlements from the company. Some of that settlement was used for the initial down payment, I believe, in the setting up of the co-op. So, you know, but there was unemployment, and there are many people, again, even at the time that Sirius had taken over, uh, they were only employing 70 workers, so we're still down about 200 uh, from that period, so there were still a lot of layoffs. So financial hardship, as with any plant closing, uh, was part of this story as well. Are they now considered a minority-owned business? Uh, from what I understand, they have applied uh, to the city of Chicago for uh, MBE status. Oh, okay, because I was thinking it was one of the first things they could have done or should have done. 
Because yeah. can co-ops do that? Oh yeah, sure. I mean, they they uh you know, they, they are uh, uh, the legal entity filed under state of Illinois law. Um, you know, they 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 certainly could do that. They they have done that. And and right now, I mean, I think they're a limited liability company, uh, an Illinois limited liability company. So you know, the only difference is that you know they function uh, democratically. So you have one member, one vote. Uh, and so, you know, it's, that's the difference between a, a traditional corporation or, or LLC. So you don't default in a, into an MWB. You don't default into a minority women business establishment uh, status. It's something you have to be applied for, and then the city will certify it. So each government will do its own certification, though in Chicago we do have some cross-certification that occurs across governments. It's a great question because what you're pointing to is the possibility of opening up some new market opportunities uh, through government spending and in a way for, for local government to align uh, its procurement dollars with some economic development goals in a way that supports uh, alternative business models. So I think mean, you're pointing just by asking that question, I think really hits on a key um, strategic asset that this business can have, but it often takes months, if not longer, to get that designation. It takes to work on government contracting. All right, my last with um, how are they positioned for retooling? Because I, I happen to know that um, for <coughs> passive houses, for instance, they're looking, they want triple pane, win triple pane windows. And um, this company hasn't been too well at producing that. So I was thinking if this company could like start or begin to concentrate on doing something like that, and maybe even partnering with um, city colleges to or cat, you know, send the members there, or the, they can start doing something like that. I'm wondering, have they been looking at anything like that, or thinking about doing anything like that? They, they were looking at all the alternatives to, you know, with, whether it was government contracts or uh, looking at marketing. Because one of the, one of the things that, that was on the radar was uh, sound abatement. Uh, which was a big issue around O'Hare Airport. It's still a very big issue around O'Hare Airport and, and Midway. And so, you know, one of the things that they were grappling with was trying to, you know, how do we, with the, their existing uh, machinery, how is it that, that they could match, you know, to, to, to do those triple pane, to do, you know, sound abatement type windows. Uh, you know, it's gonna be a challenge. Is that they are working with, with equipment that is, uh, that's quite old. You know, they, they bought it from, from Sirius Energy, so it's, you know, it's, it's quite dated. Because one area, when I looked at their website that they were making some strides in, is the various other forms of energy efficient windows. So, rather, what they argue on their website is rather than tinting your windows, they've got other panes that eliminate a lot of the UVA without the glare, um, and so on. So, but all I know is what I saw on the website. Talk about windows. <laughs> Very important. Um, I'm wondering, Dan, too, if you can add a little bit more too about some of the work of the Center for Workplace Sure. Uh, well, you know, we, we work with uh, worker owned enterprises, develop worker owned enterprises uh, here in Chicago. Um, you know, our first our first client was to wear windows um, back in 2012 when we started. Uh, it was an incredible process. Um, you know, we would. It was. Uh, we met uh, two, three times a week at uh, Union Hall, like like Brendan Martin had mentioned. Hot. You know, it was. There was no air conditioning in this Union Hall, and here we are learning about, you know, uh, whether whether it's uh, a, a democratic decision making or explaining the balance sheet because that 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 was incredible. I mean, here you're talking about a group of workers that had never seen a balance sheet. Right, and here now they're like in a matter of months of this becoming real that they had to understand some level of finance. Uh, so it was it was an incredible process. They didn't they didn't have a lot of, lot of lot of time to learn. Now, as for us, you know we we uh, you know we're working with other groups in in the Chicagoland area uh, to to develop worker owned enterprises. Uh, we're working with a group in Rogers Park called Grassroots Ecology that is doing. Uh, a work cooperative that is uh, developing stormwater management solutions for people in Rogers Park and surrounding <coughs> neighborhoods and communities. 
And as I mentioned previously, there's a group in Waukegan that we're working with um, that's doing a home house cleaning uh, cooperative. So, you know, one of the challenges that we see here in Chicago uh, is, you know, developing that, that infrastructure. Because, you know, if you look at places like you had mentioned Mondragon, or if you look at uh, Emilia Romagna in Italy, there's an infrastructure in place, a very important infrastructure in place for the development of, of cooperatives. And I think for future development cooperatives in Chicago, we need to start developing that infrastructure, whether it's having access to, to capital, because we are, you know, you're right, I mean, you go, to a, you go to a lender today, and you talk about a work cooperative, they'll stare you blank, blank in the face. I mean, they don't, they don't know what a cooperative is. Um, so it's very important to be able to develop these, these the, what we call the infrastructure for the future development of cooperatives. And I think that, you know, in, in many respects, in my opinion, that's, that's probably the most important thing than to go out and start developing these one-off cooperatives here and there. You know, because if you don't have that infrastructure, if you don't have that network or, you know, in place, or even a cultural cooperation. I mean, that, that's one of the challenging things we're facing with, with, with the workers of New Era. I mean, here they are, they were in control of this business democratically, right? And so, you know, there's a mindset. You know, one of the things that, that, um, that is challenging is that, you know, as, you know as, as a cooperative developer, you have to get that buy-in from people. People have got to buy into this idea of worker cooperatives. And, you know, so that means, you know, and, and we're if you're talking about a frontline assembly line worker, they're used to taking orders, right? They're not used to, like, okay, we, we've got to figure out how we're going to move a factory from Goose Island all the way to 35th in California, right? I mean, they normally, so th there's, a, there's a, a shift in thought process that has to be done. And so from a cultural standpoint, that, that's very important, I think, for also for the future development cooperatives, is to be able to say, okay, you know what, we, we have to take control of how we think and how we make determinations, uh, particularly when it comes to our workplace. Right, because that, that, that's the, one of the important things about worker cooperatives is that the workers control have control over the, strate the strategic direction and their terms of employment. That, those are two very important factors surrounding worker cooperatives. And I think the most, those are probably more, the more uh, transformative qualities of, of a worker cooperative. So what's it going to take to build that infrastructure? Whew, wow. Uh, what, I mean, what, what are the different things that different actors can be doing to help do that? Well, let me let me introduce. We have Mark Vick here, he, who uh, is with the Center for Workplace Democracy. Kat Duffy, also from the Center for Workplace Democracy. Um, you know, I think it, it, it's 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 developed. It's 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 gonna it's gonna be years in the making. I mean, this is not something that is gonna happen overnight. Um, go ahead. Well, I, yeah, there. It's a lot of work. So we're talking about sort of fundamentally transforming some people's ideas about what it means to develop business and create an economy locally. And so yeah, this is a long-term issue. But there are a lot of exciting things happening right now in Chicago and across the United States that that are sort of the beginnings of this kind of infrastructure. And so um, nationally, there are now at least 30 different cooperative businesses associations that have popped up over the last 10 years around the United States. And in Chicago, Center for Workplace Democracy is serving as, as uh, some form of that. Um, and what's happening in a lot of these spaces is cross-sector work between the, so we, you know, we, we've been talking about worker cooperatives. There are these consumer cooperatives, the food, the food grocery stores. There are producer cooperatives that are generally in the agricultural <coughs> sector. There are utility cooperatives. There are a lot, there are credit unions, financial cooperatives. And so what, you know, the model that's being proposed is that a lot of this strength comes from cross-sector networking among the cooperatives themselves. And that starts to build the infrastructure you need. Obviously, at some point, you need to interact with policy and, and public, uh, public policy and, and state and local government resources. And as you mentioned, in, you know, there are there is advances being made there in New York and and in California and uh, in Madison, Wisconsin, and even in Chicago, you know, we've got some attention from uh, Cook County Economic Development. They, they have acknowledged that these things exist, and they, they're curious about it. Maybe we get some support there. The, the 
state of Illinois is a few people in conversation about creating a statewide cooperative development uh, association and an employee ownership center of sorts. And so, and I, I happen to work for uh, the Chicago Community Loan Fund. We do, we are a community development financial institution. And these CDFIs across the country are actively involved in, in conversations about how do we get capital and financing to these uh, community-based approaches to development. So pieces of it are out there working, and, uh, but we, we, don't have a, we don't have an ideal space yet in the United States, but we'll get there. Are there certain laws or regulations that are currently preventing that? We I mean, you know there's a logic that looks against it, but are there certain regulatory uh, obstacles? Well, in, in, in Illinois, um, it was challenging. It's challenging to, to develop a cooperative because in Illinois we're dealing with a cooperative statute that's probably I don't know, 80, 90 years old, uh, and it never recognized work of cooperatives. Uh, so, uh, so you know, there, there, there are challenges fr from a from a policy and from a legal standpoint. But um, you know, I think that you know, you, that there there are opportunities uh, on the city level uh, with you know helping develop this infrastructure. You know, New York City, as was mentioned. Um, is making headway to that in that regard, and I think I think the realization will will happen to policymakers that okay, you know what we you know if we could we, we need to do something different because you know right now Chicago is suffering from a proliferation of low wage low road jobs, and you know it's incumbent upon you know organizations like the Center for Workplace Democracy and those who care about development of cooperatives is to go to those policymakers and look hey there are alternatives to this this low wage jobs crisis, you know, and it's developing cooperatives, whether it's worker cooperatives or or, or, or food cooperatives, there are alternatives. Uh, and I think I think I mean I, I, I like to believe that there are policy makers that, that, that will see that and the light will go on, you know, and say, yeah, we do need to look at different ways of doing things. Excuse me. Would, would you you experience opposition from unions? The unions and worker cooperatives have run hot and cold over the years. And so a lot of the initial worker ownership development that happened in the United States in the early mid 1800s was actually driven by unions. Um, in much of, for much of the 20th century, the unions have been uh, uh, formally opposed to uh, worker ownership. Uh, part of that has to do with how the unions see themselves, the role that they play in the middle of the 20th century versus the role that those unions were playing in before that, um, but right now uh, they're coming back together, and so the steel workers in in uh, Ohio and Pennsylvania are are actively involved with uh, worker ownership development projects. They're partnering with folks from Mondragon on different things. Um, there is uh, yeah labor support in different ways. Obviously, UE was was fundamental in helping to get New Era going as well. So um, so that's an example. So it is. Uh, we, we hope that trend condition continues and they continue. Yeah, I mean, it seems like the steel workers are the ones that are trying to push this the furthest. Yeah, it, yeah, it seems like. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Although, yeah. I, but the one little critique I would throw in there is they're not forming a steel worker, a, a worker on steel company. They are forming cleaning companies right. and, and laundries and things like that. So the steel workers union is yeah. branching out and organizing other industries, that's and that's where you're seeing the co-op development. And then in, I know there are a few other localized cases. I was working with an organization in Memphis that's also looking to set up uh, into a sort of community labor coalition with union support to set up um, cooperatives. So, you know, I don't think it's it's not a, a foreign concept anymore to, to a number of unions in this country. Yeah, um, I uh, noticed on your Facebook page that you spent time in Iowa City and um, must be familiar with the New Pioneer Food Co-op. I'm, I'm a member of New Pioneer, man. so am I. <laughs> uh, so, in the, in the, kind of like thinking about you know disruptive innovation or uh, the blue ocean concept of a whole new paradigm. You know, you can't uh, when you talk about going to a financial institution and saying, "Can we borrow money for this co-op?" Of course, I mean, you know, it, it's a different. It's apples and oranges. Kind of, and so the idea, like the the huge success of New Pioneer, in 
changing the way we approach food, something very close to us, um, saying, you know what, we want to decide what's in the store. You know, whereas it, everywhere else, it's the store decides what's in the store. And uh, so I think that I'm, I'm just wondering if you create that whole field, whether now the co-op works. And, because obviously people are in the window business, the window business works. So there's, what's the reason why a cooperative window business can't work? You know? Well, you know, it, 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 it can work. I mean, it, it, it's, it's just, again, I mean, you're dealing with competitive forces that, uh, that are, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's a very competitive industry to, to be in. Um, and, you know, I think, I'd like to separate the two. I mean, you, cooperatives can exist, and cooperatives can, can be incredibly transformative. Uh, but I think we have to, culturally, we have to get there, right, along with the infrastructure. Um, and, you know, so that we could transform, you know, so that a cooperative like New Era doesn't have to compete against an incredibly low road company right in their back door, you know, right in their backyard, right there, you know. Um, you know, so look, it, New Era can work. You know, New Era has faced an incredible lot, an incredible amount of challenges, right? Um, and yes, they need the support of the community. Uh, they're going to probably need additional uh, financing from alternative sources, you know, if they want to keep growing their business. Um, you know, but it, it, it is possible. It is possible for, for a New Era to compete or any other sort of cooperative. To, to compete because they they have they have an advantage you know we, we were doing some research around uh, socially conscious consumers and people are now becoming more conscious about where they buy who they buy from right this is this seems to be the trend and if as a cooperative that you have an advantage over many low road companies in that regard right because you, you you're, you're, you're a values-based business, and um, you know that that's that's where cooperatives really have to play up. They have to market and position themselves in a way that look, we we are, we're much different than than you know than a than a Walmart or or a Target. We're much different than that, you know. Um, so that that's, that's. I guess I'm it. thinking in terms of the cooperative being a contagion. And so that everything that this business touches, like if in the financial sector, if it touches and needs to reach out for capitalization, then that that must be a cooperative too somehow. Yeah. And so. Uh, I just wanted to jump in. I'm with the Center for Workplace Democracy as well, but my background is in food co-ops. I started the Dilbert Little Food Co-op in Movement Square, and our store is 1,300 square feet. Um, and we like to call it intimate, but we are doing extremely well. Every year, you know, we're making more and more money in each of those square feet that we can. When we started the store, um, because of the size that we had, we could bypass banks. We financed that with um, member loans and with SBIF money and TIP money. And um, it only cost us like $150,000 to open our store because of those other uh, funding sources. We're looking at expanding now, and <clears throat> because of our track record, we've been in business for almost five years, and you know they see our income going up every year. We have banks coming to us looking to work with us on this. So I think you know there is this thing about you have to prove yourself, and we're you know this store is one of the ways that we're showing banks that cooperative businesses are viable, you know, functioning businesses. We're fighting against the public perception that co-ops are nonprofits, which is not true. I mean, that's, you can't have a co-op without a functioning business attached to it, because if the business fails, so does your co-op. So um, I think success stories like that one are helping to you know, just sort of show that and you know, get that out there. And then the other um, aspect to that is uh, within the co-op world, there are seven cooperative principles. And one of them is uh, cooperation among co-ops, which means we do try to support one another. So, um, there are housing co-ops that you know are members of the Dill Pickle because they want to purchase their food from a cooperative entity. 
and I know of at least a couple of housing co-ops that are going to New Era for window replacements because they are a cooperative. So I think you know as we get more of that going on, we'll be able to see that expansion happening. Cool. We also have a state rep now in our neighborhood who is a member of our co-op, so I'm really excited about that. So. I was going to make is um, a lot of the co-op stuff that you guys are talking about is the service economy. So what I think is the most surprising and most interesting about Windows is this is a manufacturing company. In manufacturing, making cooperative, um, you know, in a in a manufacturing setting is much more complicated because what you need is really expensive equipment and high skill in terms of running that equipment. So. It's one thing to have a bunch of workers all say, yes, I want to, want to work together. It's another thing to have the right kind of workers and the right kind of equipment. And so I think when you're talking about infrastructure, it's not just knowledge of finances and, and manufacturing. It's actually having the right kind of equipment, having the resources to buy that equipment, which is 150000 and barely get one piece of equipment in a woodworking business, which is basically what this is. And, um, so making it work in the manufacturing sector, but that's the thing that's going to bring back what I think are very good jobs, not the service jobs, but not that we shouldn't have a service economy, but we shouldn't be entirely service economy based, is really key. And so I think you need to move beyond this thinking about we're like all other cooperatives in the manufacturing sector, because you're not. You're really quite different. And as you know, I've worked with a lot of small business, small manufacturing businesses over the years. The um, issue for them is not necessarily wages. It's finding the skilled people and finding the resources to buy that equipment that makes their resource, that keeps them uh, competitive. And so I wonder if they would like to talk about that. Yeah, I think our, our you, are, you are correct. Yeah. Uh, we do need to think of, you know, a food cooperative is very different from a credit union, is very different from a housing cooperative, is very different from a window manufacturing cooperative. And in each of these sectors, we need to make sure we understand those differences and that these are very different kinds of businesses. What we're doing is we're taking an ownership model and applying it to a lot of different sectors, a lot of different ways of getting stuff done. Um, I also agree that if we want to change the economy and our relationship to it, our relationship to money and wealth creation, that we can't do it by building a lot of food cooperatives. As much as I love my food co-op, I'm also a member of the it will transform the food opportunities for the people that are members, but it's not going to change the greater economy. It's not a wealth building mechanism. So we do need to spend time in manufacturing and advanced skills, uh, products, and things like that. Um, I think our biggest opportunity is most likely in succession planning. Um, there are lessons that have been learned from the ESOP world um, I think the East the Employee Stock Ownership Plan is still a legitimate tool as a bridge to cooperative ownership. Um, I think one of the biggest weaknesses of the way the ESOPs have been used in the U.S. is that they've used them as an end unto themselves, and they, and they really shouldn't be. It should be a way to transform ownership from the previous owner to the workers and create the co-op. So I think getting ahead of the curve in succession planning means that we don't have to worry as much about uh, finding financing because it is internally financed at that point if you plan it appropriately and you don't have to worry as much about finding the skills because it's the same people that were the employees or not the owners. Um, so I, I would say that that's, that's a place where I think we need to spend some time figuring out how to track that down. So I guess I'm uh, this end of the table and this end of the table. Um, want to ask a question about the big picture and we've been talking about how, how to make them work and what the mechanics and all that. And so my question, I'm a historian, one thing, but um, my question is sort of what part of the cooperative movement uh, tradition do you see yourselves in and, and, and has some way in on this? I mean, I know a little bit about the black cooperatives in the 1930s that were part of this, you know, coming out of the Depression era, many of them were radical, they were also um, you know, linked to, to socialist movements. Um, then there were business co-op cooperatives, and they were um, local, more efficient ways to make profit for individuals. So there's that, and then there's supposed to be utopian socialist um, experiments in the previous century. So, so in the long-term view, like you know, who are your peeps in history? Uh, and broader, you know, uh, how do you see the cooperative movement as linked to other 
looking down here, I'm talking to you too. <laughs> uh, you know, to other progressive struggles, because I think one of the challenges at this moment, you know, for many of us who are um, upset and worried about the state of affairs, is how do we break out of silos? And um, you know, there are people organizing on all kinds of oppression and exploitation, and, and this is a I see one concrete response, which could be a catalyst for other things, or could be very narrowed and siloed like other struggles. So, two big questions. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, I, you know, I don't know. I, 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 I mean, I have my personal politics, um, and uh, you know, I don't know. I mean, I, my personal politics. You know, it's. It's, uh, I, don't, I would say that it's still, uh, even within the cooperative movement, you know, I, mean, I would I'd say it's still out there. Um, you know, for me, you know, I think Where that, is it? well, <laughs> you know, I, I, I look at it this way. I mean, I think that, I think that um, you know, the cooperative model is what is really going to transform our economy. Uh, and in many respects. You know, economically, obviously, socially, politically. Uh, you know, think about it. I mean, you know, here, you, as a worker, you're a worker owner, and you can't, right now, under in a low-wage working environment, you can't go to your kid's uh, uh, parent-teacher conference, right? Or, or go to a local school council meeting, right? Things that are essential to democracy, right? Besides just voting, participating. And as now a worker owner, you have a say as to whether you go to that local school council meeting or that town hall or that or even vote, right? So that's transformative, and uh, so in, in, in my view, that that's what's really going to transform things is looking at things operating in a different manner than than, than before. You know, you look at history. Uh, Knights of Labor were able to develop to over two hundred. Uh, cooperatives, manufacturing cooperatives, and obviously they they they, they raise the ire of of other capitalists and 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 policymakers, and the, and the federal government came in and said, no, you, you're not, you're too much of a threat to to the oligarchs, so we're not going to let you do that. Uh, that to me shows the power of a cooperative, particularly in a, in a network setting, and it's happening today. I mean, you look at Mondragon, you look at Emilio Romagna. You're talking about transforming local economies. What Mondragon has done to the Basque region is incredible. Yes, they have, there are aspects in which they just kind of now become the status quo. You know, they've kind of been, you know, they've kind of come into the, you know, capitalist model because now they're trying to globalize their, their operations. But at the root of it, it was incredibly radical for that time, right? So in my view, the cooperative model is, is what is really going to transform things. Now, as in terms of working outside silos, yes. I mean, I think we, at, in the cooperative movement, we, we do need to look at operating outside the, the silo of cooperatives and reaching out to other uh, economic justice organizations and groups and working with social justice groups. Um, because, you know, quite in my opinion, you know, if you look at cooperatives, it is very much a white, middle class endeavor. If you look at, you know, whether it's whether it's you know grocery food co-ops, uh, even to a large extent housing co-ops, it hasn't really gone to it hasn't migrated outside of white middle upper middle class America, and that to me is where we we've got to get this this incredible model into neighborhoods such as Rogers Park, Inglewood. I mean, this is what is really going to transform those. We are not, you know, and, and if we want to look at answers to the low wage jobs crisis, it is in the cooperatives. That's my view. Um, I will fully own my idealism, but I also am pretty practical when it comes to um, economics. And I think that uh, right now I see those of us working on co ops as um, sort of like a front line of pushback to this race to the bottom that we see in all other ways. You know where wages are being driven down and jobs are being lost in order to increase you know the profits 
of these companies, I think co-ops can be whatever the co-op decides they are. So, and in that way you can also address these issues of silos because if women decide that they don't want to earn, you know, 70 whatever cents to the dollar, and they are the owners of the business, then they don't earn that. They earn you know, the way that they set it up. So I think like this issue of self-determination is um, probably one of maybe the only weapons we have um, to combat this lack of ethics that I see in the larger business world. And it's one of the reasons that I continue to work on this. It started for me with a food co-op, but cooperatives in general, I think, are really a solution to a lot of the things that we have out there. So um, not to sound too much like Evangelist, but you know, I, I think it's worth it for us to explore as a model. I'd say that, yeah, what initially got me into this is probably more radical political perspective. Um, what keeps me there is because I see it as a tool that can be used uh, to address the inequalities in our in the economy we have. And so I think, yeah, what we see in sort of uh, the comment on a lot of co op activity right now is this is sort of white middle class. Uh, that's because it's folks that are, yeah, they're becoming politically aware or more aware of the, the economics of their situation. But they also, those are also the folks that have some extra money in their pocket and can put that money together and, and start up their business. I don't think we're being successful with the model unless we are making it work and figure out how to make it work in the communities where people don't have any extra money in their pocket and, and establish it in those situations. One of the conversations in Chicago that most excites me that I, I, I get to be a part of is in England. It's a group called Grow Greater Inglewood, and we're focusing on the local food economy, but we're thinking about retail, production, distribution, um, all of those things. And it is, it is very much incorporating the cooperative element into this idea of how do we take advantage of the fact that there's interest in urban agriculture there, there's a whole foods coming in, there are other people in the neighborhood who want to make their own tomato sauce and make their own hamburgers and be able to sell those at the whole foods. So we're trying to connect those dots. And that's that's where I see a lot of excitement right now. And, and do you see the do you see the um, the co-ops as a kind of oasis in this larger kind of capitalist or do you do you see them as having a transformative potential to remake the economy? I mean, it could be a survival strategy, right, in difficult um, times, and Montagon is a good example because it, and you know, some of the early utopians, you know, Robert Owens and these early utopians, so they got gobbled up. You know, they, they became <laughs> the other. So, um, so I just wonder if you see them cumulatively, uh, not just being an alternative or a survival strategy, but being the way that we could live? And how's that going to happen without a big movement and a nasty fight? Uh, I, one of the things that excites me the most nationally right now is um, a project that a group called the Democracy Collaborative has been working on in Cleveland, where they worked with a group of people, who, I think it was like 60 workers, who started a commercial laundry facility. And um, the folks from Democracy Collaborative, which include uh, the political economist Garl Hurwitz, um, have worked with that group to link them to community institutions. So they are working now with, they have contracts with like the hospital in their community and the university in their community. So larger facilities that are there that need, you know, these, these types of things anyway. And so this gives that co their company the support they're all community members, I mean, and you know, these community institutions benefit from the work that they're doing. So it just sort of improves everybody's lot in that area. And I think that is an amazing example for, you know, the way that this can work in, particularly in areas that really need the help right now, so. Well, you know, I've, when I mentioned culture, I mean, I think that's very important, is to have that shift in culture to the point where, you know, the idea, the thought of cooperation, you know, the thought of solidarity is a second thought. I mean, it's not something, you know, it's not something that's, that's you know, out of the mainstream, that it's accepted as part of culture, you know, and I think that that's very important. And I think it's, it's you know, for cooperatives to really have the transformative <coughs> quality, that's, that I, in my opinion, that's, that's essential, is to have that cultural shift, you know, to where, you know, people, First thought is cooperation and solidarity as opposed to, okay, what do I, you know, hyper individualistic world we live in now? So. Nick, you want to respond? Uh, for that, I don't 
Oh, that was perfect. <laughs> well, it really was. And how wonderful that you were here, you were here with us. Um, any other final comments or anybody or questions that anybody would like to, to ask? So what about cooperative education institutions? Those exist. <laughs> I have, a, I have an acquaintance who's work, working on developing a essentially collectively run uh, middle school, I think it is right now, uh, South South Park in Hyde Park. Um, don't have any details on it, but, uh, but there are examples. There are a few teacher-owned uh, schools around the country, a small number. Um, there have, there are, there have always, uh, through, you know, occasionally there are sort of temporary free school institutions that have popped up now and again. Uh, they tend to not have long-term stability. So do you guys know any research that's been done showing that cooperatives are better for workers in terms of what, in my field, we would call psychosocial stressors, issues of work organization, over time, and all of those sorts of measures yeah, there, there have been studies done in Europe uh, around European cooperatives that have shown that the quality of life is better under a cooperative versus a traditional business. Um, I think if you look at, I'm trying to think of the international organization uh, that, that sponsors study. I think ILO may have, might have actually done it as well. Um, so yeah, there, there is study, in, I mean, obviously not in the US, but, uh, but definitely in Europe. Well, again, I think even Barbara's question about the transformative, both the survival and transformative possibilities here are really magnificent. So we are in support and very appreciative of your time Thank here you. today. Thank you. Can all of you make sure that you do sign the paper because I'll sign it because uh, this way we make sure that if you're not already on our mailing list that you then will be put on it. But then we can also keep you abreast for further work that we'll do on uh, worker cooperatives and maybe even some partnerships as well. Yeah, One quick thing, uh, we've started a series of events. Uh, the goal is every first, the first Wednesday of every month, we hope to hold some sort of cooperative business uh, theme event. And so we've done one, we talked about marketing the cooperative advantage. Uh, last month, we talked about cooperation on co-ops. Uh, the month before that, we played Coopoly, a game that uh, some friends of ours put together. Uh, so if you're interested in getting on that invite list, uh, go ahead and give me your information. Uh, I can share your mind and you can